Welcome back, everybody. Uh, I'm going to try and get us started mm -hmm. a few seconds early here, just uh, because these next two sessions are from two of the most respected analysts in the world of data strategy, uh, who also happen to be good friends and colleagues. And I want to give them as much time as possible. Uh, this is the first of our EDW keynote time slots. Uh, our first presentation is from Doug Laney, who is the Data and Analytics Innovation Fellow at West Monroe Partners in Chicago. His topic is the business case for the Chief Data Officer. So uh, while we won't have a great deal of time for questions after these sessions, we do invite you nonetheless to leave them your questions and comments in the window on the right side. And we'll uh, attempt to answer some of them if we have any time at the end. Otherwise, uh, we can pass them on to the speakers and, and they'll serve as a nice uh, conversation starter or icebreaker between all of you in the audience as well. Mm. Uh, I also encourage you to reach out to our keynote speakers via the messaging and networking features of the Spot Me app. Okay, I'm super interested in both of these talks, so let's jump in right now. Doug Laney, please take it away. All right, good, good afternoon, everyone from Chicago. Um, just a few blocks here from uh, from Wrigley Field where the, the Cubs play. Um, thank you, Tony, for once again for inviting me to, to speak at the, uh, this outstanding event. Uh, I know we're, we're all looking forward to resuming in person uh, it, it, data diversity events as, as soon as possible. And, um, and thank you all for joining us today. I hope um, you and all those you love are keeping safe and, and well. Um, I'm really excited to, to be followed by, by John Ladley. Usually I follow him and I've kind of followed him my entire career. So Tony, you got this in the wrong order, but um, any, anyway, uh, stick, definitely stick around for, for John. Um, he's, he's always uh, quite entertaining and, and informative. So the, the topic here is a, is a hypothesis. So let's start with a hypothesis, which is that CDOs are uh, making a difference. You know, any, as any good scientist knows and any good data scientist should know, most discoveries begin with a hypothesis, hypothesis. And we, you know, we see a lot of surveys about data scientists that have to do with their role, but don't really have much of a point to make or a question to ask. Now, I sort of took a different approach. I wanted to find out whether companies that have CDOs operate differently than other organizations. And I wanted to know if these organizations benefit in any way. So what kind of you know, different behaviors do they exhibit? And ultimately, is the CDO really making a difference? Well, it's easy to, to lay out you know, the job and the various responsibilities of a CDO, but it's, it's kind of proven difficult for many organizations to make the business case in the first place. So the findings I'm about to share with you come from surveys of over 500 organizations to date. And we're running actually a continuous study to look for uh, what kind of the changes we see over time, and I'll share those perhaps at, uh, at next year's event. So I'm not the first one to tell you that um, correlation doesn't equal causation. Um, <laughs> so I, I'm only gonna share with you kind of the findings where there's an extreme difference in organizations that have versus those that don't have a CDO. You know, one might ask, is it reasonable to assume that someone other than a CDO is driving these data-related improvements in a company that has a CDO? or that companies already exhibiting these kinds of behaviors are the ones that are that are hiring CDOs. In my experience, no, neither of these is very likely. So, you know, kind of come to your own conclusions about how strong a business case, you know, these findings are. I think it's a pretty good one, especially when we combine this kind of empirical data with our own you know, reasoning about, about the role. Um, so first, uh, let's take a look at, at enterprises as a whole. And everyone talks about becoming data-driven or data-centric, um, but do they, they and their organizations really embody or embrace this at an enterprise level. When we take a look at corporate strategies, we find that only about 50%, you know, let me forward here, only about 50% uh, even make mention of the importance of data and analytics. And almost all strategies make mention of the importance of their core assets, of course, their financial assets and production of goods and services that they deliver. And they even make mention of their human capital. The, you know, these are things that I'll show up on the financial statements in some way or another. Um, you know what doesn't exist? Data assets. And as I've discussed and written about you know, the, over the past decade, data is not yet considered a balance sheet asset by current accounting standards. Um, and, and data is not even fully acknowledged as property by the law. Therefore, it's easy to understand why 
uh, it's overlooked in annual reports, but some companies get it. Not that they quantify the value of their data as an actual asset on the balance sheet, but that they understand its value at some level and find it worth featuring as part of their, their corporate strategy. Now, is there any difference in organizations that do consider data and analytics as part of their enterprise strategy versus those that don't? Um, it, it seems it's not just you know lip, lip service. These businesses and other organizations claim to make significant use of their data three to four times more often. Uh, this isn't you know 30 or 40%, this is 300% more often. Listen, vision starts at, the, we all know this, vision starts at the top and, and it doesn't get much higher than those putting their names on the actual report or corporate strategy. And who's involved in or, or, or sorry, who's involved in or driving these kinds of high level strategies, mentioning data and analytics, well, it seems to be the, the CDO, but of course, talking about um, uh, data and analytics to shareholders isn't really the same thing as actually doing it. So what is what does doing it actually mean? Um, what does doing data and analytics actually entail? Many CDOs and other leaders talk about, uh, they often talk about transformation. You know, we're transforming our business, our relationships with customers and suppliers. We're transforming products and services or even transforming the market itself. So let's look at the, the three ways that organizations say they're, they're using data. Um, there we go. The three ways organizations say they're using data for transformation. Primarily, they're using data for strategic insights and decision making. You know, I suppose one can debate whether that's transformative in and, in and of itself or, or not. Um, Thirty percent say that they're using data to improve business performance. You know, and I suppose the degree to which you're improving business processes could be uh, considered transformative if you do it well. Uh, that is, if you integrate data and analytics into the business processes themselves, typically with the help of some form of AI or, or automation or, or you know, process automation. Next, we see that a scant 17% say they're truly transforming business processes, products and services with data. Uh, I think further study would reveal what, what these use cases are, but over the years, um, I, I've compiled over 500, nearly six or 700 now real world examples of organizations using data and analytics in innovative and high value um, ways, many of which truly are, are transformative. In fact, the next book I'm publishing is going to be a compendium of those use cases with commentary by various uh, experts around the world. It'll be, uh, be very interesting. But I want to give some examples. So uh, a couple examples. Wichita State University has transformed the way it accepts applicants, not based on grades or scores or interviews, but rather by matching particulars about them with the program's course requirements and curriculum. And this has led to fuller courses, greater student success uh, and engagement, higher revenues for the university. Or um, you can look at Vestas, which builds and installs wind turbines. Now they're using supercomputing based forecasting models to take into account 200 variables and 20 plus petabytes of weather data um, to identify precise you know, optimal turbine placement within a, a 10 square meter grid versus a 27 square kilometer grid that was previously possible. They now determine the placement, the optimal placement in like 15 minutes versus over three weeks previously. Or you could look at the city of, of Malmo, Sweden, uh, its police department that reduced nine months of manual analysis of crime data, such as communication behavior from phone calls um, in combination with crime statistics and weather and day of week and city events uh, and half a million interrogations down to three minutes of automated analysis, which helped them locate a, a serial killer some, some years ago. So just some of the examples that I've, that I've compiled. It's, it's no surprise who the typical culprit behind these kinds of transformations are. It's the CDO, but not just any CDO. You know, we recognize that there are two main classes of CDOs, one who acts more in a consultative capacity, developing data strategies and initiating um, data governance efforts and, and the like. This CDO more frequently reports to the CIO or maybe a COO. The other class of CDO is an actual executive who's truly responsible and accountable um, for all things data in the organization, often reporting to the CEO, or at least with a spot on the executive team. We find that fewer than 40 CDOs are in this category. However, um, organizations with this kind of executive CDO, the one with the resources and the influence and the authority, you know, we found that they're four times more likely to be using data to, to actually transform the business. But what about organizations where a CIO still maintains the ultimate responsibility for a company's um, 
data assets. Well, it, it seems that they're far less likely to be doing things like advanced analytics. Why? Uh, I believe this is because organizations without empowered, you know, truly empowered CDOs, um, things like data quality and, and data availability continue to be significant, you know, impediment to, to analytics. Next, we often hear businesses and data leaders talk about democratizing data, but what is you know what does this really mean? Uh, many of you, I'm sure, know you know Bernard Marr, and I think his succinct definition is as good as any. Um, it's that everybody has access to data, and there's no gatekeepers that create a bottleneck uh, to the data. It requires that you know, we accompany the access with easy uh, easy ways for people to understand the data so that they can use it to expedite decision making and uncover opportunities for the organization. So the goal is to have anybody use data at any time to make decisions with no barriers to access, you know, or no unreasonable barriers to access or, or understanding. There we go. But you know, if the goal for data to be shared freely throughout the organization, um, you know, it really first has to be considered an asset, not just talked about like one. Unfortunately, you know, our study indicates that fewer than 20% of organizations um, really treat data as an asset. Yet, you know, here we are in the midst of the information age and everyone knows the power of data, but still the vast majority of companies are still sitting in the, you know, the 20th century and haven't made the necessary cultural shift. It really shouldn't be that difficult. Most companies follow a strict, you know, asset management discipline for their other assets, you know, their financial assets, their physical assets, and even their human capital. So, you know, why can't we adopt those kinds of standards and adapt them to, to data, the frameworks, the procedures, um, toward the management of, of data assets? Uh, I think, again, it goes back to because data is not a balance sheet asset, or maybe just because we IT folks just love um, inventing new methods more than we do adapting existing ones. So, I don't know. Um, so, um, it's really no surprise, you know, we see organizations with CDOs being three times as likely to be sharing data freely among individuals and departments uh, than those with no CDO. You know, how else are you going to establish the necessary kinds of mandates and policies and procedures and cultural shifts? Uh, I'm sorry, it's just not going to happen with only a CD, CIO and a you know director or a manager level, somebody heading head of data warehouse. It's just not not going to, it just doesn't happen that, that well. CIO, CIOs have a lot on their plate other than data management. And so things like data management tend to become you know, kind of second-class citizens. So we've talked about culture change being one of the major drivers of becoming a so-called data-driven. The uh, build a data warehouse or data lake and they will come approach as, as we know has failed over and over yet, you know, business people are craving data and we hear this time and time again on client engagement. So let's take a look at some of the factors that uh, tend to be holding them back. Starting at the bottom is a bit of a shocker. Um, one third of those surveyed believe data is on a balance sheet asset. Uh, as I mentioned, it certainly should be. It qualifies as one. Um, it is owned and controlled, exchangeable for cash, and generates probable future economic benefits. That's the definition. That's the accounting definition of an asset. Um, and it's separable from other kinds of assets. But alas, you know, it's not considered an asset um, other than some some rare rare kinds of exceptions. You know, we also have a bit of a uh, data producer consumer disconnect leading to data literacy. A large swath of people who don't even know uh, who's using the data that they produce or what they're using it for. So if you're generating data without much you know, purview into how it's being used, you're probably not producing it in a way that makes it that usable. Um, moreover, if, if neither you as the producer of data nor anyone else are cataloging or describing that data, then it's not discoverable or understandable or, or even you know, trust, trustworthy. Finally, we, you know, we do see some growth in the uh, adoption and training on analytic tools beyond spreadsheets the past couple of years. But again, this isn't where it needs to be for an organization to even approach being data-driven or to optimize you know, the use of, of data and analytics. So this isn't you know, from our study, it's just from one, uh, kind of our experience at West Monroe of the dozens of companies that have approached us about establishing data literacy programs and ones we've worked with um, over the past year. Nearly every one of those requests, actually every one of those requests and conversations were exclusively from a CDO or someone with that kind of level of responsibility, not the CIOs. 
This isn't to say that achieving high levels of data literacy or fluency throughout a company isn't possible without a CDO. It's just that we don't, you know, we just don't see that happening. So assuming it takes a CDO to get such programs underway, you know, would you really want to forego a, a concerted effort in you know fast digit digi in a in a in a fast digitalizing economy like this? I, I, I certainly wouldn't. Not one of my favorite topics, which is data monetization. Um, most of my work the past several years has been with, with businesses to help develop new and innovative value streams from their data. And that's kind of how I define data monetization. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean selling data, ra but rather deploying data in a variety of ways, internally and externally, but measuring its benefit. Remember, as I've long argued, data is not the new oil. Uh, data has unique characteristics that oil doesn't. Data is what economists would call a non-rivalrous, non-depleting, and regenerative asset. That is, you can use it simultaneously for multiple purposes, unlike oil. And you can use it again and again, unlike a drop of oil, which dissipates. Uh, and data typically generates more data. Oil generates heat and energy and, you know, and pollution. But companies whose, whose leaders, business leaders, and, and data leaders get this concept, understand these differences, are the ones who are winning today. Um, and, and really poised to win in their, their, their industries. So let's examine the state of affairs when it comes to generating data-driven um, value streams. The good news, I suppose, is that about half of organizations believe they're finding ways to monetize their, their data um, externally. About 10% license data to others and a few more exchange data in return for goods and services or other commercial considerations like discounts. Um, finally, we, we see that fewer than a third of companies say they're generating data, generating value from their data in a multitude of ways. Um, this actually aligns with the, the new Vantage study we saw earlier in the year, which indicates that only 12% of CDOs have revenue responsibility. Um, without revenue responsibility, why would a CDO make monetizing data a, you know, really a, a priority? And can you imagine how far behind the curve any business is when they haven't figured out how to wield data like like cash or, or currency? Um, these are probably ones with business leaders who you know look at the company's balance sheet and don't really um, realize that they're looking at something defined in the 1930s. The balance sheets were defined in the 1930s that is largely unchanged since then. Um, a ubiquitous document that somehow you know, convinces them that data really isn't an asset and they're sure for doesn't really need to be leveraged as, as one. <clears throat> but here's a real eye opener. Organizations with a true CDO executive, we find are seven times more likely to be generating cash by sharing or selling their data externally. Again, this isn't 7% or 70%, this is 700% more often. These kinds of companies are also three times more likely to be generating other forms of commercial value by externalizing their data assets. Listen, no, no disrespect to CIOs, uh, again, they have a thankless and insanely difficult job, but they seem to continue to either disregard the potential economic value of their company's data or just really have too many other priorities like, you know, keeping the lights on and the and the disks spinning. Next, let's talk uh, briefly about data's measuring data's value. One of the, the cornerstones of, of Infonomics is that of measuring data's value. One of my original hypotheses, hypotheses was that <clears throat> most companies don't manage data particularly well, certainly not with the discipline with which they manage their other assets, because again, they're not measuring it. Um, yet, yet, you know, we all get totally geeked out over big data and how big it is, yet we IT nerds were kind of <laughs> measuring the wrong thing all along. If we'd actually paid the least amount of attention to how other assets are measured, how other assets are measured, we would have been leading efforts to measure data's various quality characteristics its potential value, its top and bottom line impact on the organization. Uh, but no, we had to fixate on terabytes and gigabytes instead. You know, as the old adage goes, you can't manage what you don't measure. And I think our failure to measure anything much about data, let alone its most important economic factors, have led to insufficient budgets and resources for you know doing things like data quality and master data management and, and so on and so forth. So here we go. You know, these are downright daunting numbers. Think about your organization's main asset, whatever that is. It's product, it's financial investments, or maybe a service you offer. Now, in your mind here, replace the word data throughout this slide with, 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 that or with whatever that, that asset is. Here, I'll make it easier for you here. Let's take a look at that. Um, so um, 
again, replace the word asset with whatever your core asset is. Now consider if you were responsible for that asset and you were one of those 89% of companies that didn't know the cost basis of that asset or one of the 88% of companies that had no absolutely no value assessment for that asset or one of the 79% of the companies that didn't gauge its quality, how long would you keep your job? This is what um, the KPMG uh, managing partner Stan Rosenthal refers to as kind of uh, as, as a kind of what, what he calls gross negligence that's just rampant throughout the, the business world. Or, or imagine you're a, a merger or uh, involved in a merger or acquisition and the private equity firm, VC or an accounting firm you're working with has a due diligence process that completely ignores the value of the acquiree's data assets as part of the transaction. Well, this is actually what I found in assessing over a dozen different due diligence methodologies from you know, household name, private equity, and, and accounting firms. So CDOs may you know, unwittingly be the company's most valuable asset, it's data, but nobody's going to know this if they, you know, if they don't measure it. Uh, I guess you could wait until your company's on the ropes to do this like the, some of the major airlines did uh, in valuing their data assets, um, their loyalty programs to the tunes of several uh, tens of billions of dollars. But you know, why wait? Um, this study did find a bit of sunshine on the topic that, um, um, Sorry, where am I here? Oh, yeah. So I guess you said you can wait, you know, to your company's on the ropes. Um, and, and the sunshine we found on this topic is that organizations with executive CDOs are like three times, three to four times more likely to be formally evaluating their company's data assets. So, you know, unfortunately, you know, without a CDO being uh, an executive team peer of the CFO, this doesn't seem to really happen very often at all. And while, as I mentioned, private equity firms and VCs and so forth, you know, may continue to entirely overlook the value of a company's data assets and the in the deals that they do, uh, we actually find that investors and markets um, are another matter altogether. Um, well, we looked at various financial indicators of companies that demonstrate certain kinds of data savvy or data driven behaviors, like hiring a CDO or setting up a data governance program or hiring a team of data scientists. You know, these kinds of behaviors are becoming certainly more mainstream. But what we found is that uh, these kinds of companies have a market to book value ratio or a, a, actually Tobin's Q ratio for you quants out there. That's nearly two times higher than the market average. It's again, not 2%, not 20%. We're talking 200% higher relative valuation. Um, and, and again, you know, I'm not sure what the causal relationship is, but there's certainly no doubt that there's something about these kinds of companies that investors really, really dig. Um, and just for good measure, we took out of the um, uh, equation um, companies that are um, making a living selling data or where data or digital goods are a primary offering. Here we found that these kinds of companies are favored by three to one over the, uh, the average company. So I've really, in all my years of research, um, I've never found a more compelling argument for embracing data savvy kinds of behaviors, developing data solutions and the need for a, a real focused executive to formulate and, and lead them. Finally, um, you know, dozens of, of CDOs and CIOs that I've met with say that they, you know, have started getting these kinds of questions from um, their their boards. Um, let me fast forward here. From their their uh, boards and senior executives. My, my advice would be to become very prepared to answer these kinds of even um, in CDO job interviews. Angels on in the form of things like, you know, how would you, or how do you intend to treat data like an asset, or uh, how would you value uh, uh, data, or how do you intend to create new value streams from data? You need to be very prepared to answer these kinds of questions, even if you're not interviewing for a, a CDO's job. So anyway, I just want to wrap up and, and in short, you know, suggest that if you want your organization to make data part of its enterprise strategy, or transform the business with data or democratize data better or raise the level of data fluency or monetize data better, measure data's value, not just to improve its quality but and governance, but also to enable the improved deployment of, of data assets and introduce advanced analytics and, and of course impress investors, then you know it would certainly seem a good idea not just to hire a CDO, but hire an executive level CDO. 
So that's the summary I have for you today. And uh, thank you all for attending and, and do continue to keep safe and well and definitely stick around for Mr. Ladley. Thanks. Doug, thank you so much. Um, so we've got a few minutes here. Let's take advantage of that and um, address a couple of these questions. Um, all right. The, the big one, and, and you actually addressed uh, some of the board level questions uh, to, towards the end there, so uh, I won't raise those. But, um, you know, the thing that, that gets the crowd going more than anything is, is when somebody asks a question about, you know, where does the responsibility and the accountability lie, whether it be within the business or, or IT? And I'm sure you've answered this a million times, but could you... Give it another go for us today, please. Yeah, you know, ultimately there's a quite a bit of shared responsibility. The the IT organization is obviously the caretaker of the technologies that they, they live on and, and flow through, but ultimately organizations need to start behaving as if data is a business asset, not an IT asset. Um, and there's really no no other way about it. You know, listen, I, I'd appreciate that the, the accounting practices are are steep, you know, have, have even recently doubled down on their antiquated and arcane notions that data is not a balance sheet asset, but it, it really, I think, is an imperative for organizations to behave as if it is. So, so would you extend that uh, to saying that data teams should reside within the business rather than in IT? Um, yes, and and the CDO ideally, you know, being a business function, but perhaps part of a triumvirate. Um, if not, you know, one foot in business, maybe another foot in, in technology, but. Um, the organizations that I think are really crushing it are those where the CDO has a, 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 a re real close alignment to, if not um, direct reporting structure into the, the business, like the, the COO or the CEO. So um, another question that comes up a lot. Uh, one more thing I was going to say there, Tony. I've actually seen some evidence, and I'm, I'm, I'm starting to research this. Organizations that have entirely um, disbanded the CIO role altogether in favor of a bifurcated organization where there's a, a CTO managing technology and a CDO um, responsible and accountable for data assets. I just met with a client a couple of days ago who said, yeah, we just didn't see any reason to have a CIO anymore. So um, I think this is a trend that's going to continue. Uh, well, you inadvertently answered Frank's question there too. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> so, <There> we go. <laughs> um, uh, with the last couple of minutes here, um, uh, this question comes up a lot too. You know, what makes a good CDO? Um, yeah, there's there's other research that I've done on that. So, and others as well. This is a great study out from Gartner recently uh, on that, testing some other hypotheses. But you know, a great CDO obviously aligned with the business, having a strong degree of data literacy, um, being able to understand um, the the unique kind of economics of of data. And I, I didn't get into that here, but we touched on it in my workshop uh, yesterday on how traditional economic models like supply and demand and productivity frontiers and marginal utility and all that econ 101 kind of stuff was all designed with traditional goods and services in mind. And nobody's really thought about how do they apply or break down or need to be recast in the in the context of, of data. The data operates very differently than other kinds of traditional goods and services. And um, a good CDO really understands that deeply and can lead the organization to take advantage of those unique kinds of characteristics. Um, there are all sorts of other soft skills and, and probably some technical skills as well that, that go into the mix. But um, I think a, a real strong awareness of, of data's unique characteristics and how to take advantage of them um, is, is, is foremost. So do you see a specific chief analytics officer role being desirable? Yeah, in larger organizations, um, there's certainly a need for a, a, an analytics officer to set up an analytics center of excellence um, to to uh, enable self-service analytics across the organization um, to do analytics governance in addition to uh, data governance. Uh, that may be a lot for a CDO alone to take on. Uh, again, it just depends on the culture, um, the way an organization is set up, and, and to, to some degree, the, its size and really the amount of data that it deals with. And I, by the amount of data, I'm usually talking about the breadth of data, the variety of data, which is a, a much more telling indicator um, than, than the volume of data. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we are out of time. I know there's a few more questions, but we managed to get through more than I was expecting. Right. So, so Doug, thank you so problem. much. Uh, really appreciate your insights here. We're gonna take a short break now. 
Uh, in the meantime, we encourage you to network with the speakers and other attendees through the Spot Me app. And uh, we'll see you back for our sponsored presentations in approximately 15 minutes at the top of the hour, 12 p.m. Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern. We'll look forward to seeing you then. Thanks very much, everybody.